I hope everyone's not click housed out, but I have a little bit more. <clears throat> uh, so uh, my name is Brooke McKim, CTO, co-founder of a company called Vantage, the, the aforementioned Vantage. Um, Vantage is a FinOps platform. We ingest cost data from, I think this slide might be a little out of date, 16 or so integrations, uh, pull it into what it essentially becomes a specialized BI tool for FinOps analysts, engineers, uh, accountants on your finance team or looking at your cloud costs. Um, general idea of the platform, uh, you can, as a user, you can filter on a uh, dozen or so different fields, aggregate on those fields, drill into those fields in a very granular way. Uh, so in this example, like drilling into a specific S3 bucket, looking at just the storage cost, for instance. Um, I spoke at the last spring meetup in New York, kind of talked about how we started on Postgres, moved to Redshift, ended up on ClickHouse, uh, ClickHouse Cloud customers since, uh, I guess almost a year ago, March of last year, uh, met them at reInvent two years ago and kind of just kicked off the conversation. Redshift was just failing across the board. Um, and so just needed to move everything um, that powered the application over to ClickHouse. Uh, so this is simplified, um, but wanted to show this because the rest of what I'm gonna talk about is just based on this schema. Um, and so this is an example cost table uh, important things are integration ID. You can think of as like identifying a, a, an account uh, of your SaaS application. Uh, the date, because it's all time series data. Uh, the amount is just the cost. And then cost type, I'm going to talk about a decent amount. That's like discount or refund or credit or tax. There's like a dozen or so fields, uh, values there. And then tags are super important in cost data. I don't know if you've ever tagged anything on AWS. So it shows up in Cost Explorer, something similar, but all the different cost providers have tags. Um, and then there's a bunch of other fields that I'm not going to touch on. Um, and then this is simplified from our real production data, but basically like what account are we querying? Uh, what's the time range? And then since cost types are included in every query, we put that on the end. And if you're not familiar with ClickHouse, um, you can kind of think of that as like your primary key or an index. Uh, in relational database land, but you only get one per table. And so it's just super important. You have to spend a lot of time there. You have to get it right. Um, <clears throat> and so I spent time on that, got that all going when I started on ClickHouse. Uh, and then everything was pretty fast. And then you go up to like our top 5%, 10% of users. Um, they can have a hundred and million, hundreds of millions of records per integration per month. They want to look at like 36 months of data. Now, all of a sudden in one query, we're talking about billions and billions of records. Um, and so I got everything go, uh, going and set up, and then I had to go on the uh, optimization for very large customer journey. And this is the presentation I wish was presented to me when I started down that path. Uh, so just wanted to present some actually pretty easy to implement, I think, low-hanging fruit for when after you figure out your order buy, basically. Um, this is just what every query we run looks like. You're selecting a date, you're summing the amount, uh, and then you're, you're querying by different things. So step one, you have to get your order by right. If you don't do that, there's no point in doing anything else. Uh, there's plenty of documentation and blog posts written on this. Um, but the, the point being like, what do I do after that? And so general rule of thumb of ClickHouse, you wanna make something faster. It sounds really simple and like straightforward, but like you either need to reduce the amount of rows you're reading or the size of those rows that you're reading. So uh, reducing the, basically the amount of gigabytes you're scanning through. First one, uh, which is actually like the biggest performance improvement we we found, it was uh, using low cardinality. This is just a copy and paste from ClickHouse's docs, uh, but not something you stumble upon in my experience. I uh, actually found it with some back and forth with the ClickHouse Cloud support team. Um, and what it's doing, and so my specific example is I'm using it on the cost type column, which I said is like usage, discount, refund, credit. There's like a dozen or so values. What it's doing is it's taking those strings and it's doing dictionary encoding. And so let's just say that usage, instead of being represented as usage every for every row, it's being represented as like the, the number zero. Uh, and then ClickHouse is doing a lookup to the dictionary and be like, oh, usage corresponds to zero. And what you're doing is you're not decreasing the amount of rows read, but you're decreasing the overall gigabytes read. Um, and you can run an alter on an existing running table and it just works really well. And it runs a mutation and just goes through everything. And it's like pretty low risk. Um, and so that just running this, uh, took a couple hours to go through. Um, I don't know how many rows we have, like 80 billion rows or something these days, but, uh, and took a couple hours and then came out the other side. It was had huge impact. 
Um, this example is contrived. It's like a relatively small amount of data compared to what we are running. Um, but, uh, oh, I actually flipped, I actually flipped these. Whoops. Oh, I flipped the result. So uh, imagine that the bottom part with the gigabytes was in the other side. But basically, um, the original query, so you can see the same amount of rows, 54 million, um, was 2.4. 2.42 gigabytes and then after low cardinality was 1.7 and this was like for one month with a smaller customer so imagine doing this when you're at like 40 50 gigabytes and having it be you know 20 15 20 like pretty big difference and then this is this is from the clickhouse documentation as well so the interesting thing here is like i did it on a column that has like 13 unique values or something um, apparently you can go up to a column that has like 10,000 distinct values, which I think is pretty cool. And then they even say that like, you can probably go up to a hundred thousand, uh, before you see performance degradation, which I think is really awesome. Uh, I've not, I have some columns that probably, uh, are suited for that and I haven't tried it for you, uh, tried it yet, but just pretty interesting. And so definitely just recommend doing this from the start and don't even think about it. Don't like, you can test it to see the difference, but it's just a win-win all around. Uh, the next one is skip indexes, uh, which I say you will stumble on, uh, stum stumble upon more frequently. But uh, there's a lot of like warning signs, I'd say, all over the documentation. Um, but in in practice for us, uh, we've actually seen pretty big benefit with little downside. Um, but I'll explain some of the downside a little bit, and you just kind of have to understand your data a little bit before you go and implement them. Uh, but similar, uh, so you can run an alter command, uh, add an index. You basically pick the column that you want to run, uh, create an index for, and then you pick the type of index. Um, we're using Bloom filters for everything. If you're using like a numeric column or a numeric data type for a column, uh, there's like min max and different things. It kind of depends like how your data is sorted as well. Um, but I would say if you're using like a string column or something similar, uh, just try Bloom filter. Um, and then the only other thing to consider is after you add an index, you do have to materialize it. And that's the actual then mutation that runs um, otherwise, it will only happen for new data that's inserted. Uh, but you can actually run uh, without materializing it, and just the new data will have the index, and the old one, old data will not, which is uh, ClickHouse handles that okay as well. Uh, but you just won't get the full benefit. Um, and so what is a skip index doing? Um, it's uh, So here you can see I ran the index without, uh, sorry, I ran the query without the index. And so that is that settings use skip index is zero, which is super convenient. Um, if you don't know explain in ClickHouse, which is the part at the top, uh, you should definitely get familiar with that if you're doing performance testing. So explain indexes equals one will basically give you that output uh, on the right side of your screen. Um, and it's basically saying, I'm looking at this table. Um, I hit the primary key. What keys in the primary key did I hit on and why? Uh, it's telling you how many parts it scanned and then how many granules within those parts. And so you can see this is my test data, but it basically is just reading every granule because I didn't, um, I, there was just one integration in this table. Um, but what you're doing with a skip index is either you're then taking those granules and you're saying uh, for this field, in this case is account ID, um, which granules actually have that account ID inside of it. Um, and then it's going to filter them out. And so you can see uh, with the skip index applied, there's an extra step in the explain. Um, and it's basically taking... I don't know what the number is, but it's, uh, it's like uh, doing a million less granules. <laughs> is that correct? Um, but anyway, point being, this is an example where you're actually scanning less rows uh, as opposed to reducing the size. Well, you're doing both, but you're reducing the size. Um, and so depends on the amount of data or the, the shape of your data and what specific columns you want to look at. Um, but in this case, we went from reading uh, 96 million rows and 4.2 gigabytes down to 72 million rows and 3.71 gigabytes. And so you can just start to chip away at this stuff and it actually makes a pretty big difference. Again, especially imagine those rows were uh, in the billions and you were cutting it by the same percentage, like pretty impactful. Uh, this is the graphic from ClickHouse's docs, um, basically explaining to you when it would be useless to use a skip index, uh, which I'll explain. Basically, ClickHouse does a lookup and say like, Okay, for this index and this value, like which granule is it in? Um, and that that has a penalty on it, uh, like it takes time. Um, and so ClickHouse basically saying like, if you're filtering on this value, which is visitor ID 1001, 
but it's actually in every granule anyway, you're actually not going to skip any granules. So you might as well not do the lookup. And so again, it's just knowing the shape of your data, doing some performance testing. Um, but definitely I would, I would give skip indexes a try pretty easy to add, uh, pretty easy to remove. Um, and you kind of just have to, to run some test queries. Um, this one is not is less of a setting or something you can apply, but I say just a methodology. Um, just if you can aggregate your data before even putting it into ClickHouse, uh, I would recommend doing that. And so some of the cost data we deal with is hourly, but we never display it as hourly. Our customers don't care about it hourly. And so we just truncate it or aggregate it to the day uh, on ingest. And so we're just inserting less records, which means less records are being scanned. Um, so that one's pretty pretty easy, but the one setting that you may not stumble upon for this and something you have to worry about if you're uh, ingesting a lot of data is on ingest, like, am I going to use a lot of memory or a lot of resources, which if you're grouping by on insert, you may end up using a lot of memory, um, but you can actually spill that to disk pretty easily. Um, and in ClickHouse Cloud, this just works. It is still pretty quick. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys are using SSDs or what you have under the hood, but um, this max by max bytes before external group by. Uh, basically means like the setting is like around 10 gigs. So it's like at 10 gigs, just start doing the rest of it on disk. And don't worry about performance so much, but just don't use all the memory in my cluster, basically. And then uh, this is the other thing, like ClickHouse is just very good at using resources if they're available, especially CPU. Um, and so if you are hitting a wall and you've done all these things, you're like, this query is still not fast enough. I recommend just like adding more CPUs to your node and it, makes it makes a huge difference but it's uh sometimes the last thing you try but maybe, maybe it should be the first thing you try but uh, we're hiring engineering go to market design have an office in little Italy, new york uh but also remote friendly um any questions tables have you actually experimented with partitioning or pre agri I'm, I'm sorry aggregate tables as well like by summary, you can aggregate them by month or a, a time period or by account or certain things. Yeah, uh, cost data is super weird. So we can't use partitions. Um, before trying, before doing any of this, like I um, immediately did materialized views uh, and mess with projections as well. And that was helpful. Um, but actually, the, everything I went over is way less overhead because uh, when you're dealing with materialized views in ClickHouse, they're basically act as another table. So you need to do cleanup twice. You need to add columns twice. Um, and so I actually was able to get rid of all of my materialized views and just uh, benefit from these performance improvements. And it's just like made my life a lot easier from an operational standpoint. And like technically, since like the account ID or the integration ID in my example is in the primary, oh, the order by, it already kind of is partition like the cost just won't look at the other sets of data and so that's where you can get like i said get the most benefit and then once you're there you can start to mess with this other stuff um thanks for the presentation this was really insightful um you mentioned a lot of these um optimizations it seems like like with low cardinality it seems like just things that you would apply to uh, i guess like a table level like for all use cases was there anything that like maybe more specific that you found for like the five ten percent that you're mentioning that like you have to optimize that maybe it was only applicable to them um yeah yeah uh, um that's where like sizing ver vertically can assist a lot with that uh just because it's still a ton of data it's still a very large data set but it can just happen a lot faster in parallel on on all the different cpus um and i'd say like uh before any of this and after all of this, like the probably bottom 80% of customers, the performance wasn't that different, to be honest, because it wasn't hitting that threshold of like, oh, this is a ton of data to go through. Um, and so again, like not a ton of effect for those 80%, but this all helped the, those edge cases, which aren't edge cases. They're like, they pay us the most money. So <laughs> but... I, um, <clears throat> how do you handle reliability uh, factor? Of, uh, sorry, what was the last word? Uh, reliability factor. Oh, reliability. Yeah. Uh, so we're on ClickHouse Cloud. Um, we run five nodes. Uh, if you don't know the architecture of ClickHouse Cloud, uh, deaggregated compute and storage. So all the storage is S3. Compute is running Kubernetes clusters, and they handle, basically, if a node goes offline, they'll just spin up a new one. It's auto-scaling. Um, and so 
it's been a really reliable product from my standpoint, and we don't have to really worry about that much. Uh, they, you know, they handle all the load balancing, redirecting network requests, things like that. Uh, first of all, thank you for this meeting. Uh, I worked with Klaus maybe in like two years, and I like this tool. It's uh, my question is, uh, will Klaus evolve to something new, like uh, move it away from uh, open source to cloud or SaaS? You have any plans for that, or do we still have open source? I'll I'll just make something up for you, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So the question was, yeah, like what, what happens with ClickHouse as a project? So, um, you know, from uh, the database perspective, we have uh, previously had a 15 person database team. Uh, in the past couple of years, we've grown it to 30 engineers and I would say 99% of our contributions go into open source. You just have to look at our repo to see how much uh, we're focused on that. And, um, you know, it's very important to us actually to keep um, the ClickHouse sort of functional interface consistent between open source and cloud usage, because we have a lot of customers that take open source and package it into OEM. And then, uh, you know, they still may want to use like our cloud for SaaS. So it's actually important for us to keep that compatibility. So when it comes to our commercial strategy, we're focused on uh, making uh, ClickHouse Cloud the best place to run ClickHouse. So you don't have to worry about the operational overhead, but really keeping ClickHouse itself open source and functionally compatible with what we run in the cloud. So that's the short answer. I mean, I have a longer answer, but yeah, hopefully that gives folks uh, confidence. That's a really important part of our strategy and it's here to stay into the future. So hopefully that helps. All right, any other questions? Going once, going twice, cool. All right, thank you.